Who is the savior? One of the coolest ladies to ever exist. I mean, you need to fall in love with Queen Esther. You have to. One of the greatest characters in the Bible. If you haven't fallen for her at least a little bit, it means you haven't really read the story right. Because it says she had so much chen, so much grace, beauty, charm, and charisma that everyone that met her sort of fell a little bit in love with her. And I know it's like, I'm not sure why we love what we love. In some cases, what we love is a blessing. In some cases, it's a curse. I love sweet things. I really like sugar. I know that that's a curse, but I love the Bible. I love the Bible. And that is like the greatest blessing in my life. The characters in the Bible, they're my heroes. They're my role models. I think about them. I dream about them. The magic of the Bible for me is that when we need it most, the book delivers a transcendent message of meaning and guidance directly to us through the ancient words of the prophets. Like somehow, miraculously, these old texts become a living word, like magic. They continue to give us guidance in the hardest of times, in the best of times. There's just no other book like it on the planet. But to really get into the Bible, you have to really get into the character. So look at Queen Esther this time, the last savior of the Hebrew Bible. Mordecai tells her, listen, the fate of all of Israel is in your hands. And Esther rises to the challenge. She knows that her life is on the line, coming before the king without permission, especially after his assassination attempt is punishable by death. And she ends up saying the eternal words, Ka'asher avadati avadati. It's like, if I perish, I perish. I mean, clearly at that moment, she's scared. But that's real courage. Going in, not fearful at all. Well, that's not, there's no bravery there. Bravery is when you're scared and you still choose to make the right choice. You know, Confucius, a Chinese philosopher once said, we have two lives. And the second one begins when we realize we only have one. And Esther, alongside all the Jews, has to face her death. She has to really think about her life. How does she want to live? And if she has to, how does she want to die? And then Esther goes into solitude for three days. She prays, she thinks, she plans. And you've seen like the great training scenes, like iconic Rocky Balboa movies. It's like the big fight and they're training and like the music is pumping. It's like, that's how I imagined those three days. It was three days of spiritual, mental, psychological training and preparation. So I fast ever so often. I've never fasted for three days. For three days, Esther trains. And after day three, she's unstoppable. She's ready. She is in the zone. You know, Haman, continuing Amalek's mission, you know, tried to terrify Israel. And Esther starts off scared, saying, if I perish, I perish. But after these days, she's fearless now. There's an ancient African saying that I just learned that says, when there's no enemy within, the enemy outside you can do no harm. For three days, any enemy that was inside Esther's mind, she dealt with. And then she cleared her mind, and then she was ready. And how do I know? <laughs> how do I know that she was fearless? You just have to read the story. Esther goes in like a laser. Like while everyone is just kind of living their lives, doing their thing, Esther, like a chess master playing the board, has already planned out five steps ahead of everyone else. It's like Bruce Lee, you know, one of the most respected fighters and athletes said, the successful warrior is the average man with laser focus. And after three days of fasting, meditating, thinking, and planning, Esther is exactly that. She was just an average girl. She's orphaned at a young age. Mordechai brought her in. She grew up, I guess, with Mordechai as her role model. But now, like a laser, she is fully aligned with God. And with that power, she becomes a hero. And that's why we fast before Purim. It's like, then the Bible isn't just a book that we read. It's like, no, no, we get to experience it just a little bit. The day before Purim, we taste a little bit of Queen Esther's journey toward greatness and salvation. It's like, we learn through her. It's like happiness. Faith is something that can be strengthened, something that can be worked on. 
It's a state of mind. It waxes, it wanes. You're stronger, you're weaker, but you can train. It's something you can develop. And Esther was building her state for three days straight. And she walks into the king's hall. She's not radiating any fear at this point. She has chosen her best life. And there are no regrets when you do what you know is right. And then her chen, her beauty, her charm, her charisma, she's electrifying. Just seeing her, the king falls in love all over again. He hadn't seen her in 30 days. The king has countless women at his disposal. But Esther is so attractive. She's so captivating. He extends his scepter to her and tells her, half of my kingdom is yours, just like head over heels. Like there's no reason that he needed to say that. And he's just like madly in love with Esther. Look at her. And, and Esther tells him, listen, this is it. If she was fearful, she'd be like, listen, tell him about the Jewish people quickly. Tell him about Haman. You got the green light. Half the kingdom is yours. Nope. She's so cool. She's teaching Amalek what a cool Jew really looks like. It's like, you tried to cool us off. Let me show you what ice cool is. And then she goes in and she's like, listen, what I really want is I'd love to have a meal with Haman and the king. It's like, oh, it's like brilliant. It's like every man who encountered Esther had a crush on Esther. And she knows that that's a gift that she has from God. It's a special chen, a grace that she was given. And she knew that Haman was no different. And having Haman drunk, all it took was a look from her in the right way when the king wasn't looking. And then Haman would give off a liking of Esther, maybe a flirt, a word, a look. And all of a sudden, the king would be like, what is going on here? Wait a minute here. I mean, this is Haman. This guy is someone that I really, someone that shouldn't be trusted necessarily. And at that time, Haman was the king's most trusted minister. He had the king's ring. He made all the decisions. Whatever he said, it was like being the king. And Esther, just in that first meal, really chipped away at that trust. But then she invited Haman and the king again for another festive meal. And at this point, it's like the king's like, wait a minute, what is going on here with Esther and Haman? Why does Haman keep on hanging out with my wife? What is going on here? The second meal, it never made sense to me for years, racking my brain. Why the second meal? Why does she invite him for a second meal? What is that second meal all about? It just doesn't make any sense. Like, what is that? And, you know, <laughs> it's like this second meal, it's like that's where Esther's greatness lies. She's so cool. She's looking at the ancient version of Adolf Hitler at her table, fearless. And she's toying with him for generations to enjoy and for generations to learn. The second meal, Haman, oblivious. It's like, Haman, you think all this is random? You think this is all just happenstance? You think this is chance? You think you have control? <laughs> Look at what I'm doing to you right now. I've spun you entirely on my little finger. You have absolutely no control. You have no idea. Nothing is random. A little old orphan girl like me has you entirely entrapped while you're feasting in your arrogance at my second meal. The second meal is just a toy with Haman just to entertain believers for centuries later, watching the arrogant Haman who thinks he'll soon have the roof of power, not knowing he has no control over his life, that a little orphan girl has totally taken control of the situation through her faith in God. He has no idea what's happening right before his eyes. You think there's no master of the world? A beautiful woman named Esther is showing you how small you really are. That's why we commemorate the holiday with a feast and wine. <laughs> the second feast is everything. It's like, oh my gosh, that's the essence of the holiday. It's like, fill my cup, it's Purim. It's like the third question, the holiday is Purim. That's, it's plural because there's so much here. Now we can understand it. I mean, look at the celebration of chance. The celebration is knowing what the chance is. Look closely at the text that we started with now. Now, the English always gets this wrong, so I try to write it for you in Hebrew here. But look at what it says. For Haman, son of Hamdata the Agagite, enemy of all the Jews, had plotted to annihilate the Jews and had cast a poor, a lot, which is the goral. That's an important word there. 
What does that mean? A poor, which is a goral, to terrify and to annihilate them. Therefore, they called these days Purim, from the word poor. He cast a poor, which is the goral. Like, what does that mean? There are two words here. And now we're getting somewhere. It's plural, Purim, because there's two words here. What do those two words mean? Let's look at the words closely. We know the word goral from the book of Joshua. Joshua cast a goral to see how to divide the land of Israel among the tribes. It was a kind of lottery, but it's a totally different kind of lottery. Look at what Joshua says in chapter 18. Joshua then cast lots, goral, for them in Shiloh, in the presence of the Lord. And there he distributed the land to the Israelites according to their tribal divisions. Poor is a lottery. Goral is the exact opposite of chance. Goral in Hebrew means ordained. It literally means destiny. Destined from above. Look at the verse again. Almost every English translation gets this wrong had cast a poor, which is a goral, had cast a lot, which is destiny. The greatest enemy of Israel from generation to generation is an idea. Is life random and meaningless? What Amalek saw as chance, Israel knew as destiny. The name Purim is plural to bring us to this exact distinction. The poor is the goral. What looks like chance is nothing less than destiny. When Haman happened to dismiss Vashti, he brought in Esther, thinking it was about him when he said, this is the way to honor the man who the king loves. He ends up honoring Mordechai and humiliating himself. Drawing a lot to kill all the Jews turned into the day when all the Amalekites were killed. Trying to break the spirit of the Jews, not only did the Jews return to God in fasting and prayer, but many of the nations around left the pagan realities that they were attached to and became more Judean and more biblical. It says that the nations of the land, the believers, started to become more Judean. They said, I'm leaving the pagan rituals and I'm going towards the biblical. It's like Haman tried so hard to erase it and all he did was light up the world. Haman and his sons tried so hard ultimately to stop the temple from being built in Jerusalem. You learn that from the book of Ezra. But it was Esther's son who Haman brought into the palace that enabled the building of the second temple. And the tree he prepared for Mordechai, oh, that happened <laughs> to be used just for him. It's like all these things that seemingly just happened by chance was nothing other than biblical destiny and divine providence. The poor, the chance, is the goral, is the destiny. The last book of the Bible brings all the way back to the greatest battle from generation to generation. This is how our relationship with God will be until the coming of Mashiach and his hand is on God's throne. It's like we are fully in this world where we discover that the world is nothing other than God himself. There is nothing other than him. That's what the scroll of Esther means, just like what Ari said. Megilat Esther. It means the scroll of Esther, but those words literally mean to reveal the hidden. When we read the book of Esther, you reveal the hidden hand of God because it couldn't have been any other way. But the essence of the holiday is to see the chance and know that it's destiny. It's more than that. Listen to what Rav Daniel, one of my dearest rabbis, taught me a few years ago. It says, all of a sudden, there's a woman savior. That's something so different in the Bible. Until then, it was almost always Male saviors, what is that about? It's the final stage of redemption. See, a father, if we see God as a father, well, fathers come and go. They go out to work, and then he comes home. And if the children are bad, the mom will say, oh, you wait until your father comes home. I'm going to tell him what you've done. And then the father comes home when things get chaotic, and then the father saves the day. Like, well, the Jews are in distress. God, come and save us. And then God was not there, and now he is there, and he comes and he saves the day. No, a new way to relate to God is a mother. She's always there. The Shechina is the divine presence. It's a feminine word. The divine presence returning to Israel is that there's a mother that's always there, 
nursing the baby, always with the children. The final revelation will be that God doesn't come back and forth and leave and go and save us when we're in trouble and he's away. His Shekhinah, like a mother, is a constant presence. We will be given the eyes to see that what manifests in this world that looks like a random poor, like a random chance, is actually his goral. It's actually his destiny. It's like in our recent history, generations after Haman, a new Amalek rose in the form of Hitler to annihilate all the Jewish people once again. And you know, you think about Amalek, it's just remarkable. Each time Amalek appears, he seems to rise up right before the Jewish people are returning to the land of Israel. On our way from Egypt, at, we're like, on our way to Israel, Amalek comes and attacks us. Here again, after the destruction of the first temple, we're on our way back to build the second temple, on our way back to Israel, Haman rises up again. And then again, in our generation, as the Jewish people started returning to the land of Israel and modern Zionism was born, right before the rebirth of the state of Israel, Amalek manifests once again. But today, now when the spirit of Amalek, the spirit of doubt, the spirit of fear creeps in, is this all just random? This virus, this world, these elections, what's going on here? The world need only to look at the land of Israel and see the order in the chaos. The world need only to look at our fellowship of believers who are so beautifully aligned with biblical destiny, walking out the vision of the prophets to see godly order in this world. And of course, that's the ultimate personal message. That is what Purim is really all about in, on a Shema level. Like for us, in our souls, if Israel has a destiny, all of us have a destiny. Shalom. My name is Jeremy Gimpel. A few months ago, we started an online seminar teaching life-changing biblical wisdom revealed from the original Hebrew and straight from the mountains of Judea. With global instability on the rise, more and more people are turning to God, realizing now they don't exactly know where to look for guidance. The Bible says the guidance will come from the land of Israel. What started as an online seminar has grown into a global fellowship with hundreds of members from over 30 countries. We are participating in fulfilling prophecy as we learn the Bible through the eyes of prophecy with a focus on what it's telling about us in our lives today. What you will discover is that the wisdom transmitted thousands of years ago is speaking directly to us in our time right now. Instead of learning the Bible as a religion, it's the Torah of Israel, the living guidance of God. So please join us for our next online gathering and get access to the full library of teachings that the Land of Israel Fellowship is offering. Join now and get an audio series on the prophecy encoded in the book of Joshua, absolutely for free. Just click on the link below or email fellowship at thelandofisrael.com. I don't know how you found this video or what compelled you to click on that link, but I don't believe in coincidence. And I would encourage you to take the next step on your journey toward the land of Israel. I hope to see you at the Land of Israel Fellowship. Shalom.